And we just pray that we can be to each other the example that we ought to be and uplift each other in love. And we pray that we will continue to gain wisdom through thy word to be the examples on this earth as we all. At this time, dear Lord, we pray for those who are mentioned who have sick and those who are past. And we pray that we can Watch over them and, and comfort them as thou knowest they're in need of. This time, dear Lord, we pray for...
Brother David, as he stands before us, that he may have a ready recollection of those things he's prepared to say, and that we as hearers can take them to our memory and apply them to our lives, that our faith can grow stronger in thee, that we can remain steadfast and unmovable to the end of our lives. We pray that they'll go with us now through the for the portion of this service, and may all things be done in according to thy will. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for inviting me to come. Uh, I have been with you on several occasions in your summer series and in vacation Bible schools, and I'm just thankful that I'm still on your list. I, I appreciate the invitation to be with, always look forward to being with this group of folks. I've got some connections with one or two folks around here that go way back if you count the connection of my mother and father and, uh, and some connections on, on my wife Beth's side. Uh, so I, I feel almost at home and uh, I appreciate the invitation. Have uh, been looking forward uh, to this ever since uh, Mark gave me that invitation. I want to be sure and keep my story straight. Some of you may have said, well, the church has not been on Redland Road for 29 years. And that would be true. We, we were the Highland Gardens Church of Christ in Montgomery. I started working there in 1993. And then in 2002, that congregation relocated and built a new building up on Redland Road. And so I always just lump it all together. Same, same bunch of folks, just two different geographical locations. So 29 years is, a, is correct. And boy, that's a long time. And I, you know, after a while, a preacher gets to wondering, well, do they just feel sorry for me letting me stay here as long as they have? And maybe they're afraid nobody else will come, or maybe they're afraid nobody else will have me. Uh, but whatever the reason, I still uh, love that church very much. Uh, look forward to getting into the pulpit every time I have the opportunity, and unless something bad goes wrong, that's, uh, that's a couple of times every Sunday. Uh, if you uh, get a chance, come see us. If uh, as long as you're, and I, I'm not putting out a, a shameless plug here. I know there are one or two of you that are already familiar with our website and the archived sermons there. So on Sunday nights, if you're not meeting and and you uh, you want to catch a, a recorded worship service or a sermon, uh, look look us up <clears throat> on the uh, on the internet. RLRCOC.com. Uh, we uh, isn't it amazing how far we have come with technology? I'm not a big technology guy, other than in the areas into which I've been forced to be, and it seems like every day that's that's a growing uh, area. But uh, I believe we've we've really made a lot of progress in so far as the church and the growth of the church and the ability of the church to grow, I'll put it that way, <clears throat> in getting, getting the word out all over the world. It's, it's a little bit staggering to think about the fact that at any given time, anybody anywhere on the earth who has an internet connection can connect up and watch a live-streamed worship service uh, and hear the gospel preached if that's what's being taught, and we hope and pray that it always is. A about 1,500 miles, that would be the answer to the question. That's unfair because you don't know what the question is yet. So let's go ahead and get the question out there. The question, uh, the answer to which is, about 1,500 miles. You know how far 1,500 miles is? That's, that's about as far as it is from Montgomery, Alabama to Denver, Colorado. Now, I've been to Denver a few times. Uh, 
always on the fastest mode of transportation that is commonly available to most of us, uh, a jet airplane. And uh, I think you can go from here to Denver in a space of about four hours if uh, you get on the right plane. So a distance like that is really not anything significant to us uh, for the most part. But that's how far Tychicus had to go with the letter in his hand from the Apostle Paul that was addressed to the church in Colossae. About 1,500 miles from the Roman prison where Paul was to the city of Colossae. Tychicus carried that letter to those brethren. If you're like me, you, you enjoy reading and studying the book of Colossians. The little letter is just packed so full of, of so much good, everyday, useful information, useful for the cultivating and, and, and the strengthening of the spiritual person. And Tychicus traveled about 1,500 miles. Most of it, I'm thinking, was probably over the ocean. I wouldn't begin to be able to understand or even estimate how long a journey of 1,500 miles would take a man in the day of Paul and Tychicus and the church at Colossae. That reminds me that we probably ought to slow down a little bit every now and then and think about how significant it is that the letters that are now bound together in such a convenient form for us were distributed and sent and delivered to those who needed that first-hand information. Not even thinking about all of the workings of the providence of God in bringing all of those letters together so that we're able to have them bound in a single volume today. But just think about the work that was involved in getting those letters out to every congregation they were sent to. You know... We don't think very much about the significance of how easy it is to communicate these days. There is no good excuse for not communicating. Because communication today is such a simple matter. I mean, you don't even have to go out to the mailbox and put a letter in there with a stamp on it and raise the flag and wait for the mail carrier. You can do that if you want to. And if you've got three or four days for that information to get to wherever you want it to go to, you can use that method. But I have an idea that most of us will just simply sit down at the computer or maybe even the tablet. Some of us even work from our smartphones and zip an email off to someone or a text message. In fact, uh, I've heard the number, the average person in, in today's society uh, sends and receives an unbelievable number of text messages. I'm a, I love it. I'm very appreciative of how easy it is to send and receive all of those messages. But think about the difficulties involved in getting the word to all of those brethren in New Testament times to the church in Corinth. The churches of Galatia who no doubt read the letter to the Galatian Christians and then passed it on to one another. The Colossian brethren read their letter and Paul's instruction was, when you've read this, send it to the church at Laodicea and you read the letter I sent them. We don't even have that one. When Tychicus went to Colossae and delivered that letter, 
It appears that Tychicus had a traveling companion with him. If you look over there in Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, Paul says, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. That was one of the responsibilities that had been placed upon Tychicus in addition to delivering the letter to the Colossians that Paul wrote to them. Paul says, Tychicus will give you a full report of all that's been going on with me here in this Roman prison. He says, he is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts, and, and with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they, Tychicus and Onesimus, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. It seems that Onesimus also had a letter that was to be delivered to a member of the congregation there in Colossae. It was not a long letter, it was just a very short note. It was, a, it was the briefest of notes, in, in our terms especially. And that note was given to one of the principal members of the church there in Colossae. Would you, would you like to read that letter? I'm not trying to get you to read other folks' mail, but in the spirit of reading the inspired Word of God, turn over a few pages in your Bible toward the back, and you've already figured out I'm talking about the little letter to Philemon. You see, Philemon was a member of the church there in Colossae. And when Paul sends Tychicus to deliver the letter to the Colossian Christians, he says, I'm sending also Onesimus. And when you turn over to the book of Philemon, the little single page, short, very brief note, a personal note actually, regarding a singular subject, the subject was Onesimus. And Onesimus, you may remember, had run away from Philemon. He was a servant in Philemon's house. Onesimus had run away. Somehow Onesimus had found his way 1,500 miles to where the Apostle Paul was in that Roman prison. And subsequently, Onesimus appears to have been taught the gospel of Jesus Christ by Paul. And he obeyed the gospel. And now, Paul sends him back to Philemon in Colossae and he sends him back with an incredibly wonderful introduction. He is one of you. He is now our brother in Christ. Oh, he'd been a troublesome fellow when he was a servant of Philemon. We know that from what Paul tells Philemon. There seems to be an indication that maybe Onesimus had even stolen something from Philemon when he ran away. And Paul talks about in his letter to Philemon how helpful Onesimus had been to him, Paul, after he had become Paul's son in the faith. But Paul felt compelled to send him back to Philemon. 
And he wrote the letter asking Philemon to receive him back. No longer as a slave, but as a brother. Philemon was a good man. It is evident in everything that Paul writes to him. William Barclay, the commentator, writes in one of his commentaries on the book of Philemon, words that describe Philemon, and, and I've latched on to this description of Philemon. Barclay says that Philemon was a man to whom it was easy to appeal. A man to whom it was easy to appeal. I want you to think about that for a minute. Would that be the way someone would describe you or me? A person to whom it was easy to appeal. I want us to come back to that point before we're finished a little bit later on uh, here. But I want to think more about Philemon and the kind of man that he was. And see if perhaps there are some lessons that we can learn not only from Philemon himself, but also from Onesimus and from what Paul recommends that Philemon do. This is a little bit of an unusual study. I dare say most of us have never heard a, an entire sermon. In fact, I preached this sermon uh, some time back at Redland Road, and my, my mother uh, attends services with us there, and after the worship service she said son I don't believe I've ever heard an entire sermon on Philemon she meant that as a compliment and I certainly took it that way I, I'm not sure I've ever heard a sermon an entire sermon on Philemon there's so much about him though that will help us to be better in our service to the Lord before we talk about Philemon, though, let's talk a minute about Onesimus. Onesimus, the, the man who had run away from his, his duty, his job, his responsibilities as a slave, the English Standard Version calls him, a servant of some sort. We really have no knowledge of why Onesimus was in that role. There were many reasons why people would be enslaved in Paul's day. In fact, I remember Jesus in Matthew chapter 18 taught a parable about the unforgiving servant, the one who was forgiven of his master, a tremendous amount of money. You remember the story how that then, upon being forgiven from his master, he then went out and found a fellow servant who owed him just a little bit of money, and he refused to give him any time to pay that and had him thrown into debtor's prison. There were many people who were imprisoned and some even were enslaved because they owed a debt and they were working a debt off. I'm told that the Roman Empire had as many as 60 million slaves within its board. Now the Roman Empire pretty much took up all of, of Europe in those days. 60 million slaves. And I've also read that the Roman Empire took a certain special interest in slaves. They paid close attention to them. Not because they were concerned for their care, but because of the risk that was involved in 60 million people who could possibly get together with a singular interest and aim against the empire. For whatever reason, Rome was overrun with slaves, and many of them were fugitives. So we know that Onesimus had been Philemon's servant or slave. We also know that Onesimus had obeyed the gospel. If you're there in the book of Philemon, look at verse 10. 
I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Paul uses similar terminology to describe Timothy. Remember, my son in the faith, my child, Onesimus, I became his father in my imprisonment. Evidently, that points to the fact that Paul had baptized him or had converted him and Onesimus had obeyed the gospel. We also know that that Onesimus then had become very helpful to Paul. Look at verse 13. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. Verse 14, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. Paul says, he helped me out a lot. But I think it's only right to send him back so that he can help you. We know from what Paul says about him that he was a, a very trustworthy person. Back, <clears throat> back in Colossians chapter 4, as Paul is writing to them and telling them he's sending with Tychicus Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother. You say, well, how do you, why do you say that, that he was very trustworthy? Think about it. Paul sends him back to the place that he had run away from, 1,500 miles along with Tychicus. If he wasn't truly converted and if he wasn't trustworthy, that wouldn't have ever worked. Onesimus was a very unique man. But look at how Paul describes Philemon. Notice at the beginning of the letter, Dear Philemon, no it doesn't say Dear Philemon in my Bible, but that's the way we would begin a letter like this. But in his traditional way, Paul says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister. Aphia is a female name. I believe Aphia must have surely been Philemon's wife. Stay with me on this. And Archippus, our fellow soldier. Do you suppose Archippus could have been their son? Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, Athia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. Here's why I say this is all one family. The next phrase. And the church that is in your house. In Colossians chapter 4, near the end of the chapter, Paul makes reference to Archippus. And he says, say to Archippus, so see that you fulfill the ministry you have received in the Lord. Here's the scenario as I see it. There's Philemon, a leader in that congregation. There's Aphia, his wife, a good Christian woman. Their son, Archippus, who is the minister of the congregation, and the church meets there in their house. You say, well, that's a lot of conclusion drawing, and I'll own up to that. But it seems to be a safe conclusion. At any rate, Paul is very complimentary of them. In verse 4, Paul says that Philemon has caused him to be thankful. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Anybody ever told you that? Would you agree with me that if we really are what we claim we are, people ought to be telling us that all the time, shouldn't they? I thank God always when I remember you in my prayers. 
because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. The love and the faith that Philemon openly showed around him bore the fruit in this relationship. Paul says you've brought joy and comfort to the hearts of those around you. Verse 7. Also in verse 20. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. He was a man in whose obedience Paul had great confidence. Look at verse 21. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Doesn't it make you love Philemon? Doesn't it make you wish you could meet him? Doesn't it make you wish he were here in this congregation? Well, let me ask you something. Isn't he here? Aren't every one of us faced with the same kind of opportunities that Philemon had to be this kind of person? I said at the very beginning that Philemon was a very good man. Somebody says, well, sure he was a very good man, David. He was a Christian. I like that way of thinking. Do we really think that way? If we say someone is a Christian, or if we say that we are a Christian... Does that automatically mean we are also a very good person? It should. But I know some people who claim to be Christians. And I wouldn't describe them as a very good man or a very good person. But brothers and sisters, isn't it true that those things ought to be synonymous? If we're going to wear the name of Christ, we should live in such a way and conduct ourselves in the way and speak in the way and act in the way that people say, that's a very good person. We've only got a little bit of time left, I think about five minutes, and so let's look at a couple of things that Philemon teaches us. Number one, back to the words of William Barclay, the commentator, Philemon teaches us the lesson of approachability. Approachability. A man to whom it was easy to appeal. There are some people who just by the very nature of their personality are easier to approach than others. And there are some by the very nature of their personality that are, that are kind of tough to approach. But what about our character in general, would we be described as an approachable person? Paul knew from the very bottom of his heart that he could approach Philemon. He knew that it was easy to appeal to Philemon. Look at what he's asking him to do. I don't know what it was that, that Onesimus stole from Philemon when he left. You notice Paul even says, whatever it is he owes you, put it on my account. Charge it to me, brother. I'll take care of it. Anybody ever done you wrong? Did you have trouble getting over it? 
Some folks have been wronged and they still haven't gotten over it. Philemon was easy to approach. That's a lesson we all need to learn. It's a lesson that elders need to learn in the Lord's church. It's a lesson that preachers need to learn. In the church. It's a lesson that every single member in the pews need to learn. We all need to be more approachable. I'm not talking about being gullible. I'm not talking about being the kind of people who are easy to be talked into everything that comes along. But if we're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, one of the early steps is to be approachable. Number two, let me suggest that this little letter teaches us the fact that the greatest possible life changer is Christianity. The greatest possible life changer is Christianity. Look at Onesimus. He was worthless. Paul even makes reference to the fact that before he was nothing but a troublemaker. He was, he was, not, he was not useful to you. He, he was a problem to you. But now he's obeyed the gospel. He's a Christian, and he's not like he was. There is not a single event that should take place in any of our lives that will change our lives as much as obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ and becoming a child of God should change our lives. And it's a permanent change. It's not a temporary change. Shouldn't be. The greatest possible life changer is Christianity. Number three, this little book teaches us that Christian relationships account for great accomplishments. You know, we can't know for sure, but there seems to be an indication in what Paul writes to the church in Colossae that he'd never even been to that congregation. He'd never even visited them before. He obviously knew Philemon. Where he made him along the way, we have no idea. But what a relationship Paul had with Philemon. It's reflected in all of these things that he says to him. What great accomplishments are made possible because of Christian relationships. And especially when we can appeal to one another. When we can approach one another. We can help and receive help from one another. What if you were the only Christian on this earth? This little letter is about loving and helping and encouraging. What are we doing? Thank you for your kind attention. I hope we've all benefited from this study of God's Word. You know, daily Christian living ought to be something that each of us is vitally concerned about. Because as I read the scriptures, I can come to no other conclusion but the fact that God wants us to serve Him every day, all day long, without interruption. The relationship that we are to have with Him is not a start, stop, start, stop, on, off, on, off, like the lights. While the lights in a room 
can benefit us when we come in and we flip the switch on. When we go out of the room, there isn't any benefit to us to leave the lights on. That was a lesson I learned early at home. But there never is a time when the relationship that we're to have with God isn't beneficial to us. There never should be a time when we turn the light off so far as our relationship with God. In Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Paul says, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your affection or set your minds on things above and not on things of the earth. I'm here to tell you I live in the real world just like you do. I get up every morning and I go to work at a secular job and I rub shoulders all day long with some, sometimes some pretty coarse people. And one of the most important charges that I feel, one of the most important responsibilities that I think you and I bear is to live every minute with every word that we say and every deed that we do to create a positive influence on those around us. And sometimes those around us, as I say, are some of the most coarse people, people that we don't usually hang around with by choice. And yet, I'm amazed sometimes when they come to me with something that goes beyond their earthly concerns and existence and they want to talk about something not because they've learned that I'm a preacher, not because they think I'm a Bible scholar, but because by the way that I try to live, they know that I'm a Christian. And every day I stumble and make mistakes and blunder through things that should go smoother. And I have an idea that we're all very much alike in that. And so there never comes a time when we should let our guard down. There never comes a time when we shouldn't keep trying. There never is a good time to keep laying there when we stumble and fall. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to get to the starting point of Christianity, and that's believing in Jesus as God's Son, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, and being buried with Him in baptism to have your sins washed away and rising to walk in newness of life. If you've done that, but have become unfaithful in your service to God, if you've let the world be a greater influence on you than, than the Lord and His Word and His will, you need to fix that. Take whatever steps are necessary to terminate that kind of living Come back to a heavenly Father who loves you and wants more than anything on this earth to forgive and to restore. We're going to sing an invitation song, and if you're subject to the Lord's invitation in any way, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.
Will you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the many blessings you've given us. Tonight we're mindful of the Bible and all the lessons, such as Philemon. Father, we're grateful for these guiding books in the Bible. Father, we're also so grateful for your son Jesus, who died on the cross to save us from our sins. In Christ's name we pray, amen.